Greetings, I am Pastor Anna Riki, and it is a joy to be with you in worship today. Yes, just as we gather with our ancestors across time, we gather with each other across space. You don't need much today, you only need yourself. Wherever you are, I invite you to center yourself for worship with a deep breath. Come, just as you are, to worship God along your fellow siblings in Christ. May God meet you where you are. I just want to say a word about this sacrament, this gift of God. It is open to all who seek to follow Christ. And even in these days, as we worship online, there are ways that we can prepare together for in-person baptism or even unique ways to do baptism while we are apart. If you feel the Spirit moving within you to take a leap of faith and join this community of believers, we are here for your questions. Please do reach out. Uh, you can contact me by emailing pastor at stjohnunited.org. I would love to accompany you and find others to accompany you on this journey of faith. Now, if you are home, I invite you to find a source of water so that this can be an experience that you have not just with your eyes and ears, but with your whole body. If possible, a source of clean water is ideal, but any access you have will do and God will be present through this moment. Alleluia! Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia! Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are raised with Christ to new life. Let us give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning you created us in your image. You planted us in a well-watered garden. 
In the desert you promised pools of water for the parched, and you gave us water from the rock. When we did not know the way, you sent the good shepherd to lead us to still waters. At the cross you watered us from Jesus' wounded side, and on this day you shower us again with the water of life. We praise you for the gift of your salvation through water for the water in this font and for water everywhere. Bathe us in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Satisfy the thirsty and give us the life only you can give. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. to us, sought us out when we are lost, comforted us when we have been hurting, and given us peace when it seemed most elusive. Grant us this day a feeling of abiding presence. Help us to receive your spirit as our partner, alongside us and even within us. Grant us the courage to trust that your spirit enlivens us, that we need not be good enough, smart enough, strong enough, only present to receive your love. Stir up our hearts and our lives by your Holy Spirit so that we might be grounded in your love and walk more nearly beside you. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. The first reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 17. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, God, who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is God served by human hands, as though God needed anything, since God himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one ancestor God made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and God allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for God and find God, though indeed God is not far from each one of us. For in God we live and move and have our being, even as some of your own poets have said, for we too are God's offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. 
While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent, because God has fixed a day on which God will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom God has appointed. And of this God has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. The psalm of the day is Psalm 66. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of God's praise be heard, who has kept us among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a spacious place. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows, those that my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings of fatlings with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams. I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Selah. Come and hear, all you who fear God, and I will tell what God has done for me. I cried aloud to God, and God was extolled with my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly God has listened. God has given heed to the words of my prayer. Blessed be God, because God has not rejected my prayer or removed God's steadfast love from me. The second reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 3. Now who will harm you if you are eager to do what is good? But even if you do suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear, and do not be intimidated. But in your hearts, sanctify Christ as Lord. Always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you an accounting for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and reverence. Keep your conscience clear so that, when you are maligned, those who abuse you for your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if suffering should be God's will, than to suffer for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, in order to bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which also he went and made a proclamation to the spirits in prison, who in former times did not obey when God waited patiently in the days of Noah during the building of the ark, in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. And baptism, which this prefigured, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, with angels, authorities, and powers made subject to him. The Holy Gospel according to the 14th chapter of John, the Inclusive Language Bible. If you love me and obey the command I give you, I will ask the one who sent me to give you another paraclete, another helper to be with you always. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot accept since the world neither sees her nor recognizes her, but you can recognize the spirit because she remains with you and will be within you. I won't leave you orphaned. I will come back to you. A little while now, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me, because I live and you will live as well. On that day you'll know that I am in God and you are in me and I am in you. Those who obey the commandments are the ones who love me, and those who love me will be loved by Abba God. I too will love them and will reveal myself to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When I say the word leader, who comes to mind? 
presidents and politicians, owners of companies, police officers, judges, bishops, pastors. I find our current moment both fascinating and frustrating as a window into how we view leadership and followership. That's right, I'm turning the word follow into a noun. <laughs> it's a moment worth witnessing. How we as people, both groups and individuals, respond to being told what to do, or not being told what to do, or being given conflicting or confusing messages about what we should do. Whether we're being told to stay home or mostly stay home or wear masks or close stores or work or not work, who do we listen to and why? Who do we trust and why? Who do we follow and when do we lead? In the time when Jesus walked, there were leaders and authorities also. The human structures of power looked a little different, but people were still people. Authority often still came from force and from abusive forms of power that were ever present. Who was supposed to lead and supposed to follow may have seemed non-negotiable, as it may still seem to many of us today. When I say the word leader, who comes to mind? It matters what we think about leaders and who we choose to follow. Our gospel for today comes from Jesus' goodbye speech. It begins with, if you love me and obey the command I give. Is Jesus a trustworthy leader? Will we love and obey? How do we know what to do? It's not always a straightforward answer. If not simply because there are many sources that claim to speak for Jesus, that claim to interpret Jesus for us, that claim to represent the authority of God. It matters what we think, what we feel, what we know. The Greek word, that we uh, call evangelism, evangelion. Sometimes we call it good news. It actually was a word used to describe a decree by the emperor, by Caesar, to announce his accomplishments, his good news. Good news to Romans, usually. Bad news for the conquered. How do we know real good news? Who do we listen to? When we think of a leader, who comes to mind? I believe that one of the reasons so many were drawn to Jesus, brothers who dropped their nets, their livelihood to follow him, crowds that surrounded him, women who preached about him, I believe that draw was because Jesus embodied a kind of divine leadership that was craved. He was not a leader because he wore flashy robes or crushed any hint of oppression, but because he led alongside, because he saw the divine spark in each person, whether rich or poor or despised or revered, because he didn't expect blind devotion, but a new kind of vision. Not unquestioning followers, but faithful engagement. Because rather than being a leader like the kind they had known, his contemporaries, Jesus was a leader and a follower. His was a ministry of mutuality with God, following God's call in his life to walk alongside people, to embody love and obey commands made out of love. 
And he constantly said that he was from God the Father or Abba God. And so every encounter was an opportunity to name that the power we have, all of us have, is from our common Abba God. People, I believe, were drawn to Jesus because he emanated, seeped, shown trustworthiness, real accompaniment. So you may have noticed I've been using the inclusive language Bible more often in these days. And so you will hear and have heard some language that's new to our ears. One of the things I like about this inclusive language Bible is how they name that the call to translate the text comes from a desire to walk alongside those with fewer resources, those seeking justice and equity, those wanting to leave the world a little better for having walked through it. So one of the pieces of language that's new, maybe, to us is this use of Abba God in our gospel today in place of God the Father. Abba is a fascinating Aramaic word coming from the Hebrew, used to refer to a parent, but not really a term strictly of endearment or formality. You see, the word was used by children young and old throughout their lives to refer to a parent. It's more a word that denotes consistency and intimacy, perhaps a bit like Papa. It also appears in traditional Jewish liturgy and prayers, connecting us to our ancestors in faith. I find it a really special way to refer to God because it holds the intimacy of the parent language but because it's not a word that's used a lot in English, it releases some of the connotations that are both positive and negative that accompany that word father. I think the term, or just having another option, this term for me creates some space to consider how God actually appears in our lives to not assume that God is exactly the God that we've put in a box with approved terminology, but a God that continues to be made known to us along the way. If God is only Father and Jesus is only King of Kings, we are not experiencing the full picture of the God who enters the life of Jesus who walked alongside real people, a leader and a follower. It may be time to admit that we often want to be told what to do, or we want to tell people what to do, that sometimes simplicity is what we crave, a clear designation, who's in charge, who's the leader here, it would make things simpler, wouldn't it? But simple is not always better. In this goodbye speech, Jesus speaks to his disciples and they are clearly distressed and concerned about his leaving. They too have followed this leader and wonder what they will do without his presence, how much we cling to wanting clarity. Who is in charge here? Jesus, you've been in charge and with you gone, whatever will we do? Jesus responds in a way that's long, many, many verses and sometimes difficult to understand. The verses we have are only a portion because he will not be pushed into a simple Caesar-like lordship. Because what they've been up to together has been about each of them and God's abiding presence alongside them. Jesus promises 
They have not been following him for nothing, but the work is not yet done. That actually with every act of love, with every attentiveness to God's command, they have been building up their trustworthiness with each other. They have been learning to recognize God among them, becoming leaders and followers along the way. When they fed thousands together and dwelled in homes together and shared their own stories of healing and transformation, they were the living presence of God. And now, even though Jesus will not be visible to them in the way that he had been, he promises they will not be orphaned. God's Spirit the paraclete, the advocate, the accompanier will be alongside them. Because leadership as a follower of Christ is not a matter of having the right position or enough might or even the right skills. It is a matter of presence and accompaniment. Jesus' presence with them God's presence with Jesus, and now the Spirit's abiding presence for us too. As we watch people exercise authority in these days, the ones that seem most trustworthy to me are those who are both leaders and followers, those doing the hard work of balancing being truthful despite the backlash, and being, among others, and accountable to a source beyond themselves. It may be a politician, or a community gardener, or a nurse, or a bishop. When you hear the word leader, who do you see? God sees you. the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the earth, and all who are in need. Abiding God, we welcome you into the sanctuaries of our homes. Sit with us and remind us that we are never alone. Strengthen our bonds to you and to each other even as we remain physically apart. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creating God, revitalize the health of oceans, rivers, lakes, springs, glaciers, and other bodies of water that give life to your creatures. 
Especially, we pray for the Salish Sea, Duwamish River, and our local watersheds. Form us into a baptized body that protects the waters on which we rely. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healing God, continue to guide us through COVID-19. Comfort all who are lonely, fearful, or weary. We especially pray for those who serve in health and medicine, our nurses, doctors, researchers, and technicians. All who live or work in nursing homes, like the Ida Culver House, Columbia Lutheran Home, the Hearthstone, Foss Home, the Oaks at Forest Bay, and the Norse Home. Parents juggling responsibilities and children out of school. Those working overtime, as well as those unable to work. Neighbors without housing and residents of shelters, vehicles, and tents. Low-wage essential workers whom we depend on, including food production workers, sanitation workers, and grocery store employees all around the world who are feeling worn down by quarantine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Just as seeking God, we pray for the nations of the world. May heads of state and legislators cooperate for the good of all. May medical experts be heeded, and may funding serve the nation's greatest needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comforting God, you come near to us when we are lost and you hear our distress. We pray for those who suffer in any way, especially the following members of our community. Addie, Amy, Alex, Amy, Anne, Bill, Dan, Dick, Ivan, Jamie, Jason, Jerry, Jennifer and family, John, Kate, Kelly, Chris, Lisa, Marvin, Marilyn, Megan, Richard, Sharon, Ted, Tim. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For what else do the people pray? I invite you to share your prayer out loud now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Everlasting God, we give thanks for your kingdom that has no end, both here and now and yet to come. Be with all honoring and celebrating the lives of loved ones without being able to gather. Comfort those who mourn and reassure us of your endless mercy and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guiding God, give us bold and joyful words to speak in this time of trial. By your Spirit, may we find new ways to sustain the weary, and share your message of hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, we lift our prayers to you, entrusting all for whom we pray to your great goodness and grace, made known in Jesus Christ. Amen.
Greetings, friends. I have your announcements for this Sunday. Uh, the first is just my ongoing thanks for the ways you continue to support this community. Um, you have continued to send your offering either through the mail or using the website, and we so appreciate that because it really keeps things going here. You've continued to volunteer and help, help our critical services continue like the hot meal program and the shelter and i wish you could uh have been here with me this morning to see that while we are closed there is still really important activity happening um, medical services being offered uh, downstairs to our shelter and uh, food continuing to flow all done in a really cautious safe and healthy way but it really is inspiring to see uh, you all continue to work and thank you to those of you who have brought meals and that goes for neighbors and church members alike and for those who have purchased items for the hot meal program even our gardeners are out today taking care of the grounds because gardening is one of those things that's much easier to do at a distance and because you're outside it's safer so uh, just thank you you continue to inspire me with all you're doing you may not realize that there's a lot happening even more with each week that goes by online. Um, I want to say that your leadership of this church has just really been amazing and faithful in their um, attention and willingness to try new things. So there are multiple groups of folks who are meeting using Zoom. If you're interested in doing that and want some support, please do reach out to me or a council member or a Listening for a Change team member. We are happy to support you in finding a new way to help your team or group meet through the church. Um, but your council has been meeting on a regular basis, and they met recently to discuss what it will look like for us to reopen the church and uh, stay tuned. I will be publishing a letter and a video uh, very soon. You might already have it by the time you see this video, uh, laying out some of the considerations that we are taking under advisement and the way we will approach reopening. And one of the ways that we really want to approach being cautious and faithful into the future is being attentive to all of you. So we have two events coming up, uh, and there will be more information about this first forthcoming, but the first will be on June 7th. That's a Sunday, and it will likely be in the afternoon, and it'll be basically a community-wide listening event. So your Listening for a Change team will host that using Zoom, and there will be some information sharing, but it will primarily be a time to really hear from you uh, and to just connect with each other. So we're going to use uh, breakout groups using this conference call feature, which will be new for many of us, as a way to listen in small groups. And this is really open to anybody. We really encourage you to attend. Um, it's a time to see familiar faces or new faces and just share how things are going for you. So that really will help us uh, make decisions about the future because we want to hear how you're doing. And also, it's an opportunity to practice using Zoom for a large meeting. So the next event will be on June 14th, the Sunday after that listening meeting. And this will actually be a formal uh, meeting of the congregation of the membership of this church. If you're not a formal member, you're welcome to attend. You just won't have vote. Uh, and so we thought a lot about whether or not we should have a congregational meeting through Zoom or wait. 
And uh, it became clear to us that to wait would not be prudent because so many of our membership, even if we're allowed to gather in large groups legally, many of you will still need to make the choice to stay home to care for your health. And we want to make sure that our meetings are accessible to everybody. So mark your calendars for June 7th as a listening event and an opportunity to practice Zoom. And then June 14th as a congregational meeting, which we hope won't be a long one because we know there is a limit to how long we can be on conference call systems. But um, we are just really excited to be with you and to share some good news and make some important decisions as a congregation. So please mark your calendars and uh, stay tuned for more information. Finally, uh, it's been wonderful to see you in all kinds of places, whether it be meetings or online. If you are not a member of the Community of St. John United Facebook group, I encourage you to join that because we have a lot of conversation there. And I've had a wonderful time doing midweek devotions on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. So you can watch live and you can comment and I can see those comments as I am recording and respond to them. And that's just been really wonderful. And even if you can't attend, the devotion at eight, they've been about 10 or 15 minutes long. You can watch it after the fact. So that's another great way to connect us to join that group. Those are all the announcements I have for this week. There will be more to come, but thank you this day for listening attentively and for being so engaged with this community in these days. As I invite you to receive and share the peace this Sunday, I want to invite you in particular to consider receiving the peace and how you might experience that fully. Perhaps it begins with starting with a longing. In what places in your life has peace seemed elusive? At what times this week have you longed for more peace? Dwell in that feeling of longing for a moment. And now, the peace of Christ be with you all and also with you.
May the one who brought forth Jesus from the dead raise you to new life, fill you with hope, and turn your mourning into dancing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Christ is risen just as he said. Go in peace, share the good news, alleluia. Thanks be to God, alleluia. Amen.